God really does have a sense of humor. I was talking to Pastor about a month ago, and she said, I think it's time you preach again. I said, okay, let me just get through this semester. I've got finals. Summer, I'm taking one class. We'll, we'll pick a date then. She says, great. Then Thursday afternoon, Ken Salati comes and says, how are your preaching skills? And I said, why? And he said, pastor can't preach on Sunday, and all of our pulpit supply pastors are otherwise engaged. And I said, okay, I'll do it. So then I get a text from the pastor, and I said, I have finals this week. I have three papers. I have a research project. I can't even think about this until Friday. She says, all right. Then she texts me on Friday, and she says, don't you think God is saying it's time for you to preach again? Don't you think it's funny that none of our normal pul pulpit supply people are available? And I'm like, ha, ha, ha. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so here we are. Um, it is an honor and a privilege, and I pray that the Holy Spirit used me to give a message to you. It's not about me. It's yes. about God. So I am open to be the vessel, and I pray that you can receive what I have been called to speak about today. In the Old Testament, there are seven books which are referred to as the wisdom books. They are Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, the Book of Wisdom, and Sirach. Purpose of the wisdom genre is to teach us how to discern the difference between right and wrong as it relates to our lives and help us forge a righteous pathway that will allow us to live our lives the way God intends us to. If the wisdom scripture is used as a foundational tool upon which to grow, as we grow and assume responsibility for our own lives, we can begin to develop practical life skills. We'll be able to develop a healthy reverence and fear of God, which facilitates the journey of discerning God's sense of right and wrong versus our sense of right and wrong. In Ecclesiastes, we meet Koali, who is believed to be Solomon, the son of King David. Solomon is on a quest to answer some existential questions that are probably similar to the questions that we ask during the course of our lives. He explores several major paths in this quest. Initially, he explores the path of wisdom. In Ecclesiastes 1.15, it says, a twisted thing that cannot be made straight. We see his frustration at trying to learn how to correct the crooked issues in society. He wonders how can we become wise so we can help right these wrongs. On this part of his journey, Solomon learns that there are many moving parts to this life. Nothing ever actually changes when humans engage alone. The lesson here is that as we move closer to God, the universe can change because with God, all things are possible. Solomon then explores the path of material pleasures. Here, he tries to find pleasure in wine and obtaining an abundance of possessions. He gets slaves, livestock, gold, silver. And we learn that not only do material possessions not create a lasting positive influence, you get a fleeting moment of joy with them. But at the end of the day, it doesn't mean anything because we are born into this world alone without material possessions. And when we go to glory, we cannot take material possessions. He then explores the path to discern the nature of human interaction and relationships. And he finds that humans have a need for superiority, which results in an oppressive relationship dynamic. So you have one person or one group who is deemed superior, and then another person or another group who is deemed inferior. So we have an oppressor and we have the oppressed. He finds that although we don't know, although we know this is wrong, we need the wisdom of God to help us to correct these wrongs. Lastly, he explores the path of justice in society. As he navigates through this path, he appears to struggle with the contradictory nature of the cause and effect scenario. For example, 
in chapter 8, verse 14, it says, the righteous man can get what the wicked deserves and the wicked man gets what the righteous deserves. So even though we don't always understand why things happen, we are charged to continually turn to God to seek his understanding because God has a plan that is greater than anything we could ever imagine. And we just have to be obedient and open to receive that. In his quest, he is genuinely, genuinely trying to understand why there is so much confusion in this life. Why is it that things don't always make sense? He concludes that we can still enjoy this life because this life is a gift that has been given to us by God. And we can lean on God when we have questions that we can't answer, but we also have to be prepared to accept that sometimes the answers may not be what we expect or what we want to hear. Another book in the wisdom genre is Proverbs, and this teaches us to seek wisdom and maintain a healthy fear of God, to live a life which honors God and our fellow humans. If we do that, we will be rewarded with success and peace, Proverbs says. However, if we choose the path of immorality, live in an egotistical and prideful life, then the result will be devastation and shame. In our scripture reading today, we're being instructed, do not worry about those who are evil and wish to do harm. Evil will not win. We are being encouraged to place our faith in God, not in the evildoers, because God has the power to extinguish the misconception of power that the evildoers have. And only God knows when and how God will show up. At the same time, do not encourage evil. Stand up fully against it. Do not be silent. Do not be complicit. Those who are silent and allow evil to prevail will receive punishment. And those who stand up for what is right will receive abundant blessings. Above all else, be honest and truthful. And this behavior will be pleasing to God and you will receive divine rewards. This scripture spoke to me as being pretty powerful at this moment in our, our nation's history. We have a movement to suppress voters' rights, which is aimed at historically marginalized people. We have an enormous increase in race and gender biased crimes. We have a country that cannot even agree that COVID-19 is a thing. It is a pandemic. And there are people who are not willing to accept the science and they're not willing to do what the doctors are asking us to do so that we can decrease the cases with each new strain. One million blessed souls have died from COVID-19. It is real. We also have white supremacy and black militia groups preparing for a civil war. We have the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, on the precipice of overturning Roe v. Wade. We have a leader in Russia whose actions are eerily similar to the actions of Adolf Hitler some 80 years ago. And his actions could lead us into a third world war. So even though this war is currently occurring in Europe, it is so very relevant to humans everywhere and we cannot be complacent. In the midst of all this, we have a nation of people who are questioning if and how God can help us navigate through this insanity. They wonder, where is God in all of this? Additionally, when I read the scripture, I heard, do not fear, do not give up. Evil will not win. Prayer is powerful, but prayer alone is not enough. Prayer plus coordinated and methodical action is required. And with that, we can begin the dismantling and rebuilding, which is necessary in this moment. In the UCC, we say never place a comma where God, I'm sorry, never place a period where God has placed a comma. God is still speaking. The question is, are we hearing God? As pastor says, are we listening with our spiritual ears? Are we prepared to get involved to help turn things around? If the answer is not a resounding yes, then we, my friends, remain part of the problem. Our God, is a God of justice. So any action that is not about justice is not of God. It is not sanctioned by God. It is not condoned by God. It is not God approved. So when someone asks, where is God in all of this? I say, 
God is right here. God is waiting on us to step up our game and fully engage. In fact, in any instance where there is a struggle to elevate a marginalized or oppressed group to the status of equal rights, that is where we find Jesus Christ today. Jesus can be found in the eyes and hearts of those who are suffering with mental illness, mental health issues, addiction, food insecurity, racism, sexism, and so many other isms. We have the power to be liberators like Jesus when we take the time to find out why our brothers and sisters are suffering, where our brothers and sisters are suffering, and what we can do to ease their suffering. We can be like Jesus when we take the time to see the suffering in those that we don't know, and even those that we don't like, because it's easy to seek Jesus in those that we know and those that we love. Jesus was a radical liberationist, and a large portion of his ministry was based on empowering and uplifting those who are targeted by the ruling party to be oppressed and marginalized because the empire deemed them unworthy. As believers in Jesus and disciples of the good news, this is how we can be like Jesus and help those who remain oppressed today. This is how we begin to show people where God is in all of this. I don't know about you, but today my God is a mighty spiritual force with whom I commune every day and in whom I trust. I can feel my God in the soft breeze on my cheek and my daughter's giggle in my husband's embrace. I can see God in people who hate me based on my ethnicity. I can see God when I feel as though I'm trying to live what I believe God has called me to do, and the evil one sends detractors to try to dissuade me from living into my call. Oh yes, where do you see God in your lives? God calls us to see the humanity in those who, who are considered less than or unworthy by the social constructs of our time. We will not always like what we see, but God calls us to trust in him, and that is what we have to try to do. God is trying to teach us that in order to create real and lasting change, we must be willing to see with our spiritual eyes. We have to feel the pain. We have to experience the hatred. We have to get down and dirty with the ugliness and unpleasantries of these situations. Because only then will we be charged up and ready for action. And we'll be able to justify the movement of deconstruction of oppressive social constructs so that we can better appreciate the beauty and the peace and the love that will be found in the reconstruction of a more equitable social system. My friends, Jesus said, the kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the earth and men do not see it. The kingdom of God is a more equitable society and we have the power to create that. The kingdom of God is now. The kingdom of God, you are the kingdom of God. I am the kingdom of God. We are the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is salvation today and forever. So the next time someone asks you, where is God in all of this? What will you say? Let someone see God in us today. Let it be so. Amen. Won't you stand with us and sing glory, glory, hallelujah. The words are so simple, you don't need your hymnal. Just glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. Glory, glory. Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I lay my burdens down. I feel better. I feel better, so, so much better, since I lay my burdens down. I feel better. I 
us to pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Go now in peace. Amen. 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 Burdens down, Lord. Burdens down. I had to lay it down. To lay my burdens down. Everything on my heart, I just laid it down. I let it go. It's not troubling me no more. Won't you let it go and not take it back? You got to lay it down, Lord. You got to lay it down. Since I laid my burden down, let's see who's here. Yeah. Where's my? Hey, everybody. Hello. Hi. Hi how's Hallelujah. It yeah. Hallelujah. Yes. I, I Jackson is on the road. Jackson's on the road. Yes. Erica did is. a beautiful job. Yeah. Ugh. Yes. Yes. Very good. Very good. Very good. Everybody have a good week. Have you a good too. Week. I that to see you Tuesday. I'll be back Monday. Up on Sunday morning. Okay. All righty. Let's see. Thank you, Wavy.